This is Ask Joe, number 184. Please enjoy. Welcome to the Ask Joe podcast, also known as the Home Studio Corner podcast, also known as anything you want it to be. Today we are listening to an a cappella song that I recorded years ago uh, when I worked at Sweetwater, which is an audio retailer where we had a Christmas song contest. And my submission that year was to record this beautiful a cappella piece called Ave Maria, written by Franz Biebel. It's just beautiful. Let's continue listening. Isn't that just lovely? Hey, everybody. Sorry for the weird intro. I'm running out of weird things to do for the intro. So on the uh, YouTube Live, the folks were asking, um, I was asking them for ideas for the intro, and someone said a cappella, and I thought, ding, I have an old a cappella song that I recorded back when I worked at Sweetwater, um, of the song Ave Maria. So that's approximately eh, 10, 10 copies of Joe singing this m- male a cappella song uh, in my apartment in Fort Wayne, Indiana, uh, recorded in Logic, sent through a big reverb. Funny story about that project. Obviously, it took forever. I recorded to a click, which isn't a great thing to record a cappella to because then suddenly it just stays... Uh, stays very consistent and it needs to breathe. So that was the first mistake. Secondly, I I have a decent range as a vocalist, but the um, you know that that goes down to like a low G or an F, very low. Not like I can belt that out. So Logic had at least at the time had this, and that's right. I was a Logic guy for about two years. Logic had this sub octave generator plugin. And it would take audio and would essentially, you run audio through it and it would generate frequencies an octave down from whatever you were singing. Or it was maybe even subharmonic, so it was more than just an octave. So anyway, I slapped that on the bass tracks and in my tiny little five inch speakers in my tiny little apartment studio, it sounded pretty good. So I submitted it, turned it in. Uh, over Christmas, we go home to visit my wife's family and... They want to hear what I've been working on musically. Well, of course, I hadn't worked on anything but this dumb a cappella song. And it's not dumb. It's very beautiful. But um, so they wanted to hear it. So I plugged in uh, Burn a CD or something and put it in their home stereo. And as soon as it kicks in and that bass goes down to that super low note, the subwoofer just goes nuts because it had all this low sub bass material because it was taking my voice and octaving it down a couple octaves in it anyway. I was very sad because there was way too much low end. So just now, as I brought that into this session, I EQ'd it how it should have been EQ'd back then, and it sounds a little bit better. Still pitchy, still not great, but there you go. There you have it. And I did not win the contest that year. I did win it the next year, by the way. Um, Remind me, in a future episode, I'll play that song for you. Um, I did my own version of Deck the Halls. (laughs) <laughs> it was it was awesome. It was actually really cool. The speakers. So if you if you're familiar with me and you've seen a tour of my studio, you know these big M Audio EX66 speakers that I use. Um these guys right right there. See that big guy right there? I actually won sorry, I won those speakers in that Christmas song contest. Um it was sponsored by Avid who owns it was Digi Digi Design at the time. They owned M Audio, so I won that, I won a Sputnik microphone from M Audio. I won a 003, I mean, I won a bunch of stuff. It was really cool. But not off of that song. That's another story for another day. Okay, so today I want to talk about, um, what do I want to talk about? There's something I want to talk about. First of all, if you haven't checked out Mixed Together, you need to. Just go to homestudiocorner.com, you will find it. Uh, download the tracks to the song Mission, Mix along with me. Uh, just yesterday, I posted video number three, getting into the static mix, really starting to make the song come together. And um, first first video was about setup. Second video talked about phase stuff. And um, 
Face stuff with the drums, which is always important and dorky and nerdy and not that fun, but you got to do it. Um, and then this week we finally got into setting some levels and doing some things like that. So if you are not mixing along with me, you need to check it out. Mix together. It's all free. No obligation required. Someone in the live chat says it was an interesting English accent. Um, and I don't know what that means. And then they're saying, I, I don't know. I can't, I probably said something wrong a minute ago too. I don't, I don't know. So what I want to talk about here briefly for the rant, and then we'll get to your questions, <clears throat> is this idea, and I explained it in Mixed Together, and I want to kind of go through it a little bit here. It's a very technical thing. So kind of straying away from my motivational talks, and we're going to talk about something very specific. And it's this question of, and the question came from Cesar Pineda, and he says, why mix with the trim? So if you go and watch the Mix Together series of videos, or if you've seen some of my other mixing videos, I tend to try to, um, I tend to try to mix the song and adjust the volume of the audio files themselves to where most of the faders are sitting at right around zero. And I explained that in the video, but I'm going to explain it here as well in case you missed the video and don't get a chance to watch it. So the idea is, if you take a fader, and let's say the typical fader, I'm going to hold it up if you're watching the video, you can see this PreSonus fader port, right? It's got a fader right here. Um, it's a normal throw fader. So what is that, about four or five inches up and down. And so up around zero, where the fader defaults, is got the most resolution. I can move this up and down by an inch, and it's probably going to be a variation of 10 to 12 dB. So a decent variation in volume, but a little tiny move will give me a half a dB adjustment, okay? So there's a lot of uh, resolution up here. If I pull the fader down here, where it's a, you know, a quarter or the, three quarters of the way down, now there's no numbers on here, but go look at your fader in your DAW, and you'll notice when you move that same range of motion, that same inch movement, is probably 20 or 30 dB volume difference. Now, why does that matter? It matters because mixing is all about subtlety. Um, well, I'm sorry, that's not true. It's not all about subtlety. But there are times when you're mixing where you want to grab a fader and move it just a dB or a half a dB. You just want to move it just enough. If you keep, if your, if your tracks are too loud and then you have to bring all your faders way down, it's really hard to move that fader just a tiny little bit to get the volume adjustment that you want. There's no resolution. And what I mean by that is there's no, the, the, the difference from one movement to the next and the big jump in volume, there's not enough resolution there to do a subtle move in volume. So that's why I'd use a lot of the trim plugins, not trim plugins, but the, the mix um, clip gain features inside my DAW to adjust the actual vo volume of the audio file itself so that it hits my fader where it feels like it's at a decent level coming through the fader at zero. Um, this helps you not have your tracks too too loud and, and which will help you prevent from clipping your mix bus um, also if things are too quiet it keeps you from most DAWs zero and you have about 10 or 12 db above zero to boost things well if something's way too quiet you boost it all the way up and it's still not loud enough another reason why you'd want to trim that up to a decent volume around zero so if you go in and you download the tracks for mix together and i saw someone in the chat says they can't get to the tracks uh shoot me an email joe at homestudiocorner.com will take care of you um, if you download the tracks and bring them in and set the faders to zero, you'll notice they're, it's fairly balanced right out of the gate because that's kind of how I tend to set the volume of the audio files themselves. So that's just a little quick tip, something to try out. I'm not saying it's the right way, but the way I've explained it, to me it just makes sense. So for me, I'm going to keep doing it that way because that seems to make the most sense to me. But um, always have a reason why you do something. You can try stuff. But for me, doing things because someone told you you should isn't a good reason. And uh, doing things because that's the way you've always done it isn't a good reason. But doing things because you have an idea of what it might do and how it might help you, such as the thing I just explained with the faders and the resolution, that seems like a good idea to do something. Okay? Boom. <laughs>All right, let's jump into your questions. By the way, if you didn't know, if this is the first episode of the podcast you were listening to, I stream these live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Central. You can catch that on my Ustream channel. Um, I link out on my Facebook and Twitter pages. 
which my handle there is Joe Gilder Music. You can also subscribe to the calendar and have it show up in your calendar so you don't forget when you're looking at your day to make time for me. And actually, that means making time for you because I want to answer your questions, and I tend to take most of the questions here live. So work it around your lunch break and come hang out with me and a few other home recording audio hooligans, and let's, uh, let's answer your questions and help you get better results in your studio. By the way, that calendar is at homestudiocorner.com slash calendar. It's just a public calendar you can subscribe to, and I show up in your feed. Not in your feed, but like you literally look at your calendar and I have infiltrated it. And you see, oh, Joe's doing a podcast today. Or, oh, Joe's got a concert tonight. Or, Joe's doing a live concert. Or, Joe's doing a VIP mix critique session. Those types of things show up there. Pretty handy. Helps keep me accountable. And it helps keep you informed. All right, let's go to the questions. First, over in Facebook, um, J. Robert Jaynes is asking for good recommendations for wall mounts for guitars and bases. I don't know of any, um, although Joe Fox said Hercules makes good ones. Um, I would go check that out. Um, folks in the chat are telling me that I have disappeared from the stream, and that stinks. This will be recorded, so hopefully that'll be okay. Um, the internet is a crazy place. Next up, um, Scott says, Scott Bennett says, a few years back, you were really keen on using a timer in order to set micro goals and stay focused while mixing. I'm curious to know if you still do this. I don't do this um, during mixing. Um, I, I, I do a variation of this, um, but I don't set a timer anymore. I've done that in the past. I actually bought, I might still have it. Let's see. Stand by. No. You know, I think I gave it to my kid. Um, I actually bought a cute little like stainless steel egg timer that would go tick, 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 tick. And um, I would uh, use that when I needed to work on stuff. So it kind of gave me that sense of intensity. But as you might realize very quickly, that's awful for mixing because who wants to hear that tick, tick, tick while you're mixing something if it's not in tempo with the song? So that was a bad idea. But I have done timers before. And I think... Everyone should work to a timer at some point in your life. Set up a time this weekend to try to mix a song in an hour or give yourself 60 60 minutes or 30 minutes to do something that seems challenging to you, seems challenging to be able to pull that off. What you'll find isn't that the timer is magical, but our brains are pretty awesome. And if you give yourself all the time in the world, you tend to work a little more slowly. But if you force yourself that like I'm going to try really, really legitimately try to get this done in an hour, interesting things happen. Um, You kind of start to focus on what really matters. You can't get bogged down in stuff that doesn't matter, and it's very interesting. Does that mean I think you should do that all the time? No, I don't think you should be fast for the sake of fast, but I think you should be efficient because that means you'll get done sooner, you'll maintain momentum. We talked about that recently, and you'll get more music recorded and done so you can work on more projects, and if you want to make music, then... You know, or if you want to make money with music, then more the more projects you can do it in the least amount of time, the more money you can make, and maybe actually make this into a uh, a revenue stream for you. So that that all those to say, if nothing else, it's just satisfying to release music, and if it takes you forever because you don't set deadlines, then I would suggest setting them. So I don't use a timer anymore. I do still use deadlines all the time, uh, even down to micro deadlines. Of let me show you. So I, I, I go all over the place. Every few years, I'll switch out what I use to kind of track my day. Sometimes I'm in a calendar, the calendar app on my, on my phone, on my computer, and that kind of plans my day. Lately, I've been kind of back in analog world using a notebook. And what I do is, I'm, you can't really read this, but I'll have my day planned out. Everything's kind of a checkbox, a to-do. And the most important things on the list get blocked out in time. So I've got, you know, blocked out two hours to do this podcast and get it edited and uploaded and posted to Facebook and YouTube and all that. Um, This morning, I wanted to write for an hour. Um, I needed to finish. I need to clear out my inbox. That took about an hour. I set an hour to kind of do some like end of the month stuff. It's the first of the month and I had to run some numbers and figure out some stuff. So I just, I I decide what's important then I set time during the day to do that. Um, You can go overboard with that, but I found... I'm much more productive when I'm working from a plan than if I'm just freewheeling all the time. And the same is so true in the studio. I mean, we're it's a toy store, right? You look around, 
I could be distracted by anything in this room. And a little bit of distraction is nice, but golly, when you just jump from one thing to the next for hours at a time, you just feel bad at the end because you never really did anything. So yeah, I, I like to find different ways, micro goals, bigger goals, deadlines to keep myself focused for sure. Um, let's go over to the chat, all you lovely folks who are here live. For those of you having issues, I apologize, but it's, a lot of it depends on your internet speed where you are. Um, Jason says, what's the minimum acceptable RMS output to you? I was told around negative eight. So for me, negative eight RMS output is the equivalent of like a DR8 measurement on a dynamic range meter. So to me, DR8 is eight to 10 is kind of where I hang out. Um, and occasionally seven and six, but that gets pretty loud. The thing is, to my ears, when you push something so loudly that the limiter is just going nuts on it, it just doesn't sound that good to me. So I tend to not have things be as loud as everything else on the market. Um, is that a maybe a flaw on my part that I can't make it sound good at that volume? Um, I don't know. But I do know that currently I tend to like things around at mastering at an RMS of maybe, yeah, I think eight works okay. Again, your ears are the ultimate deciding factor. If you start depending on a meter to tell you what things sound like, you know, you're going down a dangerous path. David says, can you explain K metering system or the K system? Yes, I will try very quickly. Um, the K system metering, and let me open it up here. Um, let's see if we can have it open up while I'm talking. Uh, let me do this. I'll pull this down and I will hit this button. Okay, so now I've got audio coming through and let me insert, I'm actually going to do this live, insert a level meter on the master fader here. And I will change it from the RMS. So this is typical, you can't see this. Let me switch to full screen for a second. Okay, so you can see right now this meter, okay? It's a typical RMS meter. It's showing me the peak levels, and then that white line is showing me um, how. Uh, wait, that might you not might not be able to see that. Can you see this? Move it over here. Um, so that white line is showing you where the average level is. If I switch to the K system, so let's say K20, which I use for mixing, that white line essentially transforms to a green bar. And the louder I talk, if I crank up the volume of my voice through the system you'll see it gets louder and louder and louder until there's a yellow section. So a zero, at zero, it changes from green to yellow. And then it goes up until about, I don't know, another four or five dB above that, and then it changes to red. And the red is kind of the loudest section. So the way to use K-system metering, set it up to K20, calibrate your speakers to where something coming through at K at you know negative 20 RMS feels like a good mixing volume, and then just mix. And the idea is, the loudest sections of the mix will come through at, um, at, at oh, sorry, the, the bulk of the mix should come through with the volume around um, the where the green turns to yellow, right? So kind of at that spot. And then the little bit louder sections of the song turn yellow, and then the loudest sections of the song get red. And all it is is just showing average level. A, it keeps you from getting so loud that you're going to clip your mix bus because you kind of already know when you're getting into the yellow and a little bit of red that you're getting close, so you kind of keep things tamed down. It also keeps you from, by not having it be too loud, it keeps you from compressing so much to get the volume back down where it needs to be. So that's the basic idea. I use K20 for mixing and K14 for mastering. Same principle applies. It just moves the, the, the reference point up louder for mastering because obviously we want mastering to come out louder than we want the mixing. Good question. And there are there are tons of resources out there that probably just scratch the surface for you. So I would say dive into that some more and do some more research. There's some good books and or articles and things out there that'll explain it better with better examples and things like that. Back over to Facebook. Uh, Barry said, if someone could only work on one element of the mix, Compression, EQ, automation, etc. Which part would you tell them to choose to get the most bang for their buck? I love this question because my answer is none of the things that you listed. So if you watch, just yesterday I released video number three in my Mix Together series. And the entire video, I talk about this a lot, so go watch it. I'll explain it better there, is about the static mix. I talk about the static mix all the time. 
to me, especially in the last year or so, that is the single most important part of this whole thing. Because that to me is where the mix happens. Yes, you need EQ to get things balanced tonally. Yes, you need compression to kind of make things punch or tame down some volume disparities. Yes, you need reverb. Yes, you need delay. Yes, you might need distortion, saturation, all those things. But to me, a good mix is one that is a good recording and everything is balanced. The volumes are right. The pans are right. If you get that right, everything else falls into place so much more easily. So I would say, if I can only do one thing, assuming with a big asterisk that it was recorded well, I'm going to want to just use faders and pan. I could get a decent mix with just faders and panners. That's how important it is. If you can't get it to sound pretty stinking good just using those, keep going. Or improve your recording because your recording's not good enough yet. That's what I would say. Good, good question. Steven, or Steve Rossbotham says, going through the Mix Together course, nice, and it says, at the start you mentioned you mix with your tracks on separate on a separate hard drive um, to the one that your DAW is installed on so you don't run into RAM issues. What are you recording? I'm sorry, when you're recording, do you also record on a separate drive? Yes, you need to go back to my YouTube channel and go under the playlist. There's a playlist called 12 Home Studio Necessities. Uh, and one of those is hard drive, external hard drive. I explain it really well in that video. Go check that out. The idea is audio is, they're pretty big files and we're streaming them. And to have your internal hard drive streaming that while also running your computer, typically the internal hard drive isn't that fast and it also just has a lot of other work to do. So it's just good practice to have everything be streaming to and from an external dedicated drive or a separate internal drive that isn't your system hard drive. Real, just kind of basic audio, digital audio stuff. Will it work the other way? Sure, but I don't. And maybe the whole external thing's irrelevant now. But also, it fills up fast, so I'd rather have an external that I can just throw in the closet and slap down a f empty one when I need to, versus trying to figure out how to get the hard drive out of my computer when it's full or transfer things. So yeah, that that those are some of the reasons why. Adam says, um, "How do you get rid of too much room noise in an audio interview?" I tried subtractive EQ and gating, but it affected the voice too much. My client normally does a great job with her records, but I'm having trouble with this one. So you said in an audio interview, to me, um, the biggest thing is going to be gating. And the thing about gates, I would use an expander over a gate. Now I know they tend to be the same thing, and sometimes they're interchangeable, and sometimes one means something and one means something else. For me, like this podcast, for example, I've, I've given you audio examples of this before. There is a gate or an expander on my voice. So when I stop talking, it turns the mic down. It doesn't turn it off. That's a lot of times what gates do. They will turn it all the way down, you know, 80 dB down, which is essentially off. And it can be awkward because it, you go from hearing me and you're, gonna, you're hearing a little bit of room as I'm talking. And then if I stop and it goes completely silent, that feels awkward especially in an audio interview format where there or a podcast, it can feel weird. You've probably heard something where it's a fairly noisy room and then as soon as they stop talking, it cuts out or they go in and chop up the audio and delete everything in between. I get the idea, it just doesn't sound very good. So for me, the best solution has been, even in fairly noisy environments, um, is to use an expander that or a gate however you want to use it, where it doesn't turn it all the way off, it just turns it down. So if you were to listen to my audio right now, even as I'm streaming, there's a gate on my voice as well, I think. Yeah, and it's turning my voice down or turning my mic down about 15 dB. So usually 10 to 15 for me works pretty well. When I stop talking, you could still listen and hear room noise, right? You could hear that I'm in a room. It doesn't go completely quiet, but it does turn it down, so it sounds like I'm in a much quieter room than I am. Um, that's what I would do. I almost never use gates for that sort of re for that sort of use in a mix with music. I don't gate the toms almost ever. I just very rarely do I use a gate, but for spoken word, it can be really good. Now, if if it's so noisy that the gate just sounds obvious, no matter how you do it, then you may just have to live with that and tell them, hey, this is the best the audio is gonna be. Uh, I'd rather just let it be consistently noisy than try to duck out the noise between phrases. That becomes more distracting. I've heard, you know, I've seen videos where they do that, and it's more distracting than just letting the noise stay in there. Um, another option than one I don't have much familiarity with is 
if you're doing a lot of this type of work, it might make sense to invest in something like RX, which is a plugin from, um, I believe it's IK Multimedia. And RX is a noise reduction tool. A no- it's actually a noise a audio restoration tool, um, but it also reduces, it, noise reduction is one of the things that it does. So I think it's fairly expensive, but there's it, theoretically it can go in, analyze the noise, and remove it in a way that sounds natural and works well. I've, I've heard before and after results. It's pretty remarkable. Um, would I invest in it? I don't know. I've not found a need for it, but um, you'll have to decide that for yourself. Chad Martin, one of our Dueling Mixes members, says, I got my first recording gig coming up. I've got two overhead mics, a kick mic, and a snare mic. But the drummer, the drummer's kit has three toms, and I only have two mics left. Should I forego spot micing the toms and use Recorder Man overheads, uh, freeing up those two mics to do other things, like perhaps a bottom snare and a mono room? Okay, it's a good question. You obviously want to prioritize kick and snare and overhead. One thing you might want to consider is doing a mono overhead and then micing each of the toms. The other thing to consider is, is he playing all three toms? Or on the song that you're recording, does he hit the toms at all? I know it can seem like an offensive question, but if you're going to change your entire recording approach based on these toms and then he never hits one of them, well, that's just a waste, right? So... There are lots of approaches. You could just ignore the toms and do a really good job of capturing them in the overheads, but you know, you're know you going to be limited to how big they're going to sound. Uh, if he's playing the toms a lot and it's kind of crucial to the sound of the music, then um, I would say spot mic the toms. Um, and if in this scenario, what I would probably do is instead of two overheads, I'd use one overhead and use one of those mics for the other tom. Um, or if you've got the budget to just grab an, like an SM57, I mean, those are fine. You don't need a, a three, $400 uh, Sennheiser 421 to mic the toms. Uh, I use the, the CAD M179. I think it's 130 bucks. You can use an SM57. You can get those used for 50 or 60 bucks on eBay. Uh, if that still not, doesn't make sense for you, which is totally legit, um, then, you, you know, you can do the recorder man approach and that might work. I just don't love that approach. It sounds good. It sounds cool. Everything ends up being pretty mono. um, But with three toms, you're not really going to capture them evenly. And I like the idea of having my toms spread around the stereo field even a little bit. And so spot micing allows me to do that. So that's probably what my approach would be. But I would have a plan B and a plan C in your pocket for once you actually are setting up and listening to sounds, it may be that another approach sounds better. So take that into account as well. Good, 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 good. Cesar says, on mixing, it's said that mixing moves that must be made are the ones the song needs. What could be done to improve one's mixing vocabulary, if that could be said? Um, Improve the mixing vocabulary? I think you're doing it. Um, Listening to things like this podcast, hearing me talk about mixing, I mean, that's going to give you an ex... You know, the only way to learn a language is to... not the only way, but the main way is to immerse yourself. Um, or even if you learn it in a book, you know, if I learn Chinese in a book, probably going to still need to actually go to a Chinese speaking place or spend a lot of time with Chinese speaking people to really get it. So I think you're doing it. Maybe spend more time with people who mix. Um, but then again, I don't even know why you would need to know the language. Um, cause honestly, you and me as audio people talking about mixing is one thing. You and a client could be wildly different. You could have a client who knows mixing and says, hey, the, the low mids on that guitar are a little much. Could you bring those down? That's cool. Or you could have someone who says, yeah, I want the mix to sound more uh, purple. You know, now you got to decide what that means. So uh, having your own vocabulary is pretty irrelevant to using the vocabulary of whomever you're working with because they're the ones that you got to communicate with. So I don't know if there is any one-size-fits-all approach to that other than just being able to express yourself clearly and being able to get the results that you want. Um, how do you add warmth to, vo- to choral singing? Um, a lot of it depends on mic placement. Uh, the other thing is um, sometimes if you pan it everything hard left and right, it kind of gets a little thin feeling. Leave some of them panned up the middle, and then maybe just a boost in the low mids might be what you need. 
Hillel Kapnick, who used to be Hillel, before, I guess before you got so busy doing all your work that you're doing over there in New York, uh, you used to be a regular on the podcast. Maybe I just taught you too well. And, but you've, you've, the prodigal has returned. Um, he says, what tips and or techniques do you recommend for staying focused on tasks at hand and not getting overwhelmed with all the music projects you're working on? Music and business projects. You know, I get overwhelmed regularly, sometimes on a weekly basis. For me, just stopping and clearing out time to sit down with a piece of paper and just plan a little bit or sit down with my notebook and schedule some, some things out that can be really helpful. When I have to actually commit to something on a schedule, it helps me kind of siphon through or what's the word I'm looking for? Not filter. What's the thing where you you pour the sand in it and you shake it and the sand goes through? What's that called? Not siphon. Not filter. It's called a sift. (laughs) Wow, that was hard. To sift through, so, so it lets me sift through my options and determine which ones are the most important, which ones are the big rocks, as they say, and put those on the calendar. Uh, what are the just the very next steps that I need to do with these projects and get those in place? Not do them necessarily, because it might be 10 things and I can't do them all right now, but at least say I'm going to do these right now, I'm going to do those tomorrow, I'll do those on Monday and those on Wednesday. And that is has a calming effect for me at least. Um, being aware of what's going on. I tend to, when I feel overwhelmed, I don't look at anything and that makes me more overwhelmed because I think, man, once I actually dive into that project again and see where we're at, it's going to feel overwhelming. Um, Best thing there is to just have some sort of system where you regularly, regularly look at all your commitments, all the projects you're currently working on, look at their state and see if there's anything you're missing and then plan accordingly. It's not fun, but it's just part of being a big boy and I don't like being a big boy most of the time, but I'll keep trying. Let's see if there were any, I'm scrolling up to see if I missed any questions from earlier. There was one right at the beginning. All right, Arahant says, can you please tell me how to get faster with editing? Because it takes ages to edit stuff. Couple things. First of all, maybe you're editing too much. Did you ever think about that? I have a product that you are welcome to buy It's a tutorial video called Understanding Editing. Uh, I shot it in Pro Tools, and I will show you how to edit the crap out of everything. Specifically, mostly around pocketing, fixing timing issues, tightening up performances, and things like that. It's, It's necessary work sometimes. Problem is, you can get in this edit mode. I used to teach that editing was a a phase of the production process. It was pre-production, recording, editing, mixing, mastering. I don't do that anymore because I don't edit all that much. I will edit when I'm mixing something if, if it needs it. Or if I've recorded something and there's a lot of timing issues, I'll take the time to fix that one thing and only those spots that need to be fixed. But if you're going through and editing everything just for the sake of editing everything, uh, you're, you're, you're making more work for yourself. Um, getting faster at it is not the solution. Actually stop doing it and um, actually ask the question, is what I'm doing even necessary? Because the answer might be no. Now, the answer might be yes, and in that case, you have to know techniques. You have to know how to do things quickly in the sense of, are you doing it the most efficient way? And the only way I've known how to do that and really answer that question is to see how other people are doing it and to learn from them. So my understanding editing videos from a conceptual standpoint, even if you're not using Pro Tools, might be helpful. Um to help you do that. Actually, send me an email and I'll, I'll give it to you for free. It sells for 47 bucks. Um, shoot me an email, joe at homestudiocorner.com and I'll let you check them out for free. Um, if Even if you don't use Pro Tools, it might give you the concepts that will help you kind of figure out what's the right approach to this, how to do not too much, how to do enough, what to look for, what to focus on. Um, other than that, it's, it's, yeah, learning your software and knowing how to do keyboard shortcuts or the, the most efficient ways to get things done, that kind of stuff just kind of comes with time and practice and watching other people. Uh, the Weight says, hey, Joe, what's a good volume when recording vocals? Meaning when you're recording vocals, what's a good volume <laughs> for your main buses and faders to read? Uh, there is no good volume. To me, uh, just a good volume that's registering on the meter and isn't clipping. That's it. You know, if it's coming 
one half to two thirds the way up the meter and it's not coming anywhere close to clipping even when they sing really loudly, I'm good. It literally does not matter. It could be a quarter of the way up the meter. It could be five eighths of the way up the meter. It could be, you know, 15 sixteenths of the way up the meter. It'll sound exactly the same. You can match those volumes super easily. There's literally no reason to have it be louder other than this kind of preconceived notion that it just needs to be louder because that quote is better. Um, now, there is a reason to not record it at 15 sixteenths of the way up the meter because it might clip. You can't fix a clipped vocal, right? You can turn up a quiet vocal and it'll be fine. You don't want it so quiet that you have a bunch of noise, like you didn't set your preamp to have any volume, but it doesn't. you don't need to drive your converters. That doesn't do anything. As long as you got a good level, you're fine. Um, you know, for me, a lot of times I like to set levels based on my faders at zero and have the level come through and feel good, look good, it's not too loud. Great, let's go. Let's record. Let's make music. We don't need to get so technical all the time. Um, and Sherry says, I was wondering what is side chain, what is side chaining exactly and when to use it? Um, it is side chaining is different from parallel processing. And um, I'm going to extend my audio because I don't have time to answer this. Um, side chaining is the idea of, let's say, here's a great example. My good example of side chaining. Let's say I've got a really cool delay on my vocal, but it's a little bit faster delay, and every time it comes in, it it covers up the lead my vocal. It sounds cool. It's like if I'm talking and I take a breath, the delay right there sounds cool, but while I'm singing, it kind of gets in the way. So what I would do in that scenario is put a compressor on the delay and have the compressor listen to the vocal track. So I'll use a send to send the vocal to that compressor. The compressor listens to the vocal, but it's turning down the delay. So anytime I sing, the delay gets turned down. When I stop singing, the delay gets turned back up. And the end result is I hear the delay between vocal phrases, which ends up being kind of cool. So that's it for me. Thanks for watching. I'm Joe from HomestudioCorner.com. Don't forget to check out Mixed Together over at HomestudioCorner.com slash MT. See ya.